Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of the Irish Angle on Jump To It. I'm joined as usual, Johnny Ward and Emma Nagel, and we're going to discuss all the topics in racing. Uh, from the last week, didn't have a huge amount of racing. We did yesterday in Thurles, but prior to that, we've had a, a week with frost and all the cancellations. Hopefully, we're back on track for Christmas. Christmas is only another six days away. So, um, big action coming up. Johnny, Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vinny. Hi, Vincent. Now, Johnny, you're in London um, in some funny office with a with uh, all sorts of graffiti on the wall, whatever's going on, you're solving problems there, are you in the background? Yeah, problem solving today. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, you mentioned just before we came on, Vinny, the the temperature swing. It's been absolutely crazy. And I, I've, I just thought about this. It's really, really wet in London today, but it was balty cold yesterday. And obviously they've had another cancellation in England today. But in the past month alone, We've had um, Constitution Hill not running in a race because the ground was too hard. And since then, we've had cancellations because of water logging, uh, frost and fog, um, and including the all weather. And I think it was uh, somewhat of a reaffirmation in terms of what we thought we knew about life, that Ireland's only genuine all weather track, Turles, um, was the only track uh, to survive uh, this cold slab effectively. Even Dundalk itself had to cancel earlier on in the week when I was there on Monday. So um, Turles is still Ireland's only all-weather track, and it was great to have a race there yesterday. Yeah, terrific, and big news from there yesterday, Emma. Davy Russell announced that he's going to retire. 43 years of age, three-time champion, dual Grand National winner, Gold Cup winner. He's done it all, hasn't he? And what a career he's had. Yeah, it's it's sad to see Davy go. Like, I mean, he's probably he's probably the last of that real golden generation of riders who I kind of grew up watching. I suppose you know Ruby, Paul Carberry, Garrity, and now Davy's gone, and it's kind of really passing on to the new era. Now, um, he was probably the last one still going, and you know, people are probably calling him mad. A few or last year, even coming back from that injury, you know, why why was he going to bother? But I'm sure he's delighted he did now because he was. It's great for him to be able to go out in his own terms. Um. You know, he came back and he he rode as well as he ever did for the last few months, and he kind of went out. Kind of okay, it was kind of a good way to go, I think. Um, you, we we saw Frankie announcing he's going to go next year, but Davy kind of just did it in a small day in Torles. He got his winner, and he went out happy with all his family there. So it's 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 terribly sad to see him retiring now, because you know Davy was always he was always one you could rely on, I suppose. If you were back in a horse, you know Davy probably get the best out of him the whole time. He was brilliant to watch you know a real natural horseman you very rarely see a horse even getting keen with Davy. his hands were just so good and yeah he'd, he'd be a massive loss to Irish racing yeah I agree um that'd be, I, I was one of the ones who was uh questioning him coming back I really didn't think he should have come back after the um the neck injury and everything else and all the, the problems he had I really thought he was taking his life in his hands for a man with such a young family and everything else. I really thought, look, just give it up. You know, it's not about money at this stage. He's, he's, I'm sure he's well enough off after all the fantastic success he's had, and he's still going to have a great career going forward. Whatever he does, I know Gordon Elliott is saying he's still going to be part of his team. Haven't quite worked out what part he's going to be, but um, you wouldn't want to let him go. I'm sure he's a real asset around the yard. I'm sure he'll still ride work as well. Um, what do you think, Johnny? He's been one of the greats in the saddle, certainly. Without a doubt, Vinny, yeah, and uh, I, I, I'd echo what Emma said there about the kind of the end of an era, the golden era, because when Davy was sort of started riding for Ferdy Murphy, um, I'd just gotten into racing around that time, so that's what, like 20 odd years ago, and um, so the first kind of I got to know Davy was when he really did start, or the first I really remember of him was when he when he came over to Ferdy Murphy, and it didn't work out that well uh, for him, but um. I developed a bit of a fascination with David Russell at, at that time. I just like, couldn't. Paul, there'll never be another Paul Carberry for me. Um, but David's David's style and just uh, horseman is probably um, not the woke term nowadays. But if you know what I mean, uh, he was a horseman, an absolute horseman. Like, and how can you tell the dancer from the dance? In the words of Yeats, when David was on a horse, um, it was just a fusion of the artist and the art. And uh, I loved watching him down the years, completely like you said, when he got that injury, I thought with all, I think he's five young kids, um, I thought he was absolutely daft to come back, and I said that, um, but for me, the way that he bowed out was thoroughly befitting the enigma that he is, he's he's a very, very enigmatic character, um, he has that kind of mischief about him, extremely intelligent, um, sometimes you'd wonder, is he kind of... He's playing around with you in conversation at times, and uh, the fact that he went out 
nobody would have expected it at Thurles on a fairly, you know, non nondescript uh, Sunday in in the middle of December when Thurles wasn't even supposed to be the main meeting of the day. And I was in Cork in Mallow was it last last Sunday, and uh, Davy was in the that little area between the the kind of corridor between the press room and the. And the main uh, concourse, <laughs> and I, I had to come out, and he was there with his with his wife, and there must have been four kids there, and I I was trying to struggle out by him, and I said, are these are these all yours? <laughs> they were like, you don't get to, you don't get families with that amount of young kids nowadays. It's it's almost an anachronism, and I was like, how how did he come back to ride uh, with the probably the doctor's concerns considering the young kids he has? But then to do it, come back as well as he's come back and then bow out before the Christmas festival for me, like what an enigma. And Frankie de Tory, like bleeding the life out of his um, retirement. The Racing Post described it as a bombshell. Despite the fact Frankie's going to be 53 next year. I don't know. Like, how is it a bombshell at this at this stage for a fellow to go out of 53? For me, what Davey did was far more of a bombshell. He did it before the Christmas racing um, festival in the middle of the season when he seemed to be riding as well as ever. And uh, again, there's always a, the, with David, there's always something that that's not necessarily explained because of the the genius of the man. There must be more to it than meets the eye. But um, maybe he feels the time is right, and I, I can't but wish him a happy retirement. I think if he works in the media, he'd be gifted at it. I think he's brilliant at it. Anthony puts his mind to, and um, a genius of a writer for me. Well, I think certainly, I think he will go into media. Uh, I think he's compulsive viewing when he does. Obviously, he's fantastic at analysing racing in general, but he has a tendency to stick his foot in it here and there as well. So we, you never know what we might get. I know that the, there was car crash stuff when he went on the Late Late Show after Gordon Elliott had sat on the dead horse and he tried to defend him and couldn't. Um, he also had a big incident with uh, Bruce Millington of the Racing Post on a Nick Luck Sunday programme as well where he wouldn't speak to him. So lots of, lots of things there. There's a real edge when Davey's around, so hopefully it'll stay around for a long time to come. Um, we'll move on. A few other things from during the week. There's lots of things to discuss, I suppose. But we two more incidents with the um, Stewarts again, the IHRB um, coming down on a couple of small trainers again, Garode Bruder and Lee Smith. Both got their licences suspended in the last week. That follows on hot on the heels from um, Rona McNally the previous week. And we had big inter action or big reaction to our show last week and a blog I wrote as well on the same topic. Lots of people seem to have um, thoughts on this McNally case and everything else. What do you think, Johnny, around all of this? Yeah, I, like, I, I, I was, I, I've I, been on to Ronan a bit myself this week um, because I wanted to interview him at Dundalk thinking that the real deal might win on Monday and I was working at Dundalk and sure, um, he probably would have won because he won a better race on Friday when I wasn't working. Um, but I've been on to Ronan a bit this week, sort of off the record after that, just trying to... Um, get his feel of things and like there was as you mentioned Vinny there was a lot of reaction to the show last week uh, I, I I just like to say like I'm, I'm not um I have sympathy for the IHRB as well I think um if, if the IHRB is trying to go after what it perceives to be you know um stuff that's detrimental to the health of horse racing and general uh, skullduggery in the in in cases across the years um I want that to happen um but I, I still think you know with the the, the two cases the Smith and Bruder cases throughout the week um it's still consistent for me with uh, maybe a lack of consistency in terms of the rules being applied here and you know some people being put on um, on a pedestal in racing who are you know doing things no differently to people who are being given um, severe bans and I still think there's an inconsistency in that and you know the IHRB um, <clears throat> I think the, the fact that you mentioned we've had three big cases with small trainers in the space of a couple of weeks <clears throat> is is quite telling Um I mean the I, I don't know what you thought, but the, the, the Bruder band does sound a little bit on the extreme side for something that, um, for me, I mean, it's bad, but there have been a lot worse things to happen in racing. The Smith one, I think, um, he probably would put his hands up more, but maybe, it's, maybe the IHRB is trying to put a message out here that it's not going to let people away with stuff and give them quite um, punitive punishments, um, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see about that, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose just to clarify here, Lee Smith, the, the, the allegation there is that himself or in cahoot with others they doctored some passports for horses two horses in particular that the passports were doctored to show stamps from a veterinary surgeon and signature to say that they had got um the equine influenza vaccine and um, which is which is a serious illness for horses and it would would have a real effect on on the industry here if the, if that would was to 
run through the whole industry here, we, we'd see serious implications and ramifications from that. So he, he had, or he or someone attached to him had doctored these two passports. It's not 100% clear how it was done or who did it. But basically, they, they forged um, signatures and stamps on it. And he was given a three month uh, suspension for his license. They said part of it was that he acted in a manner likely to cause serious damage to the interests of horse racing in Ireland. And I can certainly see that. I can see how it could have caused serious damage if those horses had have had uh, the particular virus and infected others and it could have gone right through the whole herd. So that was one. The other one with Garode Bruder is he was he was training in one particular yard, which is a licensed premises. Um, and no major issue there. He got in touch with the IHRB to see what he had to do to move to a new yard, what, what processes and procedures he had to do, what paperwork. They explained it to him. They gave him the paperwork. He never filled in the paperwork, never did anything, and just moved yards. So they basically say, saying that shouldn't have done that. And they've given him a 12-month suspension, six months uh, suspended. So he, he will serve six months. He's actually served three already because they stopped him training the moment they found this out that he had moved to a yard that was so-called unlicensed but in in my opinion now i'm not sure if i'm 100 percent right here emma might tell me a little bit more as far as i know a licensed premises is a premises that the ihrb have come and inspected and put the thumbs up and said yeah that's good to go you can train horses there so that's a licensed premises and unlicensed premises is exactly the same but they just haven't been there to inspect it to say it's fine it could have problems which they might say no we can't accept that but in general terms it's it's no different one one yard is no different to another yard in that case so i i'm surprised that they said in the case as i said previously with the with the smith one they said he was in a manner likely to cause serious damage to the industry in the case of baruder in a manner likely to cause damage to the industry yet he is going to serve twice as long a suspension as lee smith so we're not given all the details that's the big issue here these these referral uh, press releases that they send out after these referral hearings they don't go into detail they just tell you the gist of it and just say that um trainer lee smith gave evidence trainer garrod bruder gave evidence but we're not told what that evidence was in either case and or any other mitigating circumstances as such so it's very hard to see why one guy got twice as much as the other for what seems a lesser offense what do you think emma yeah i think like even during the week there was a lot of discussion around ronnie mcnally and then these two cases come up as well i think kind of obviously as johnny said the ihrb look it's not an easy job to get everything right but i think consistency is probably the biggest problem at the moment in um in the racing in ireland because you know just even looking at ronan's case i mean fine it's fine to punish him for doing this but i think they have to go after everyone else for this doing the same things because like we mentioned last week a lot of trainers are doing similar things as him maybe not as obviously but it will have to be applied consistent consistently um, with the Bruder and Lee Smith case, it's it was an, an interesting one because look, uh, Garo Bruder, he's a, he's a young trainer. He's only he's not training too long. Um, look, I don't know a whole pile about him myself, but it kind of just seems like an administrative administrative error. Now, look, it's hard to defend him too much. Like it obviously, I think moving yards probably is a big enough deal. I mean, if you know the HRB need to inspect him, they need to know where he's where he is, where he's the horses he's looking for where they are at all times you know just in case anything needs to be checked out so you know he has to take his punishment as it comes but i did think the 12 months was very severe in comparison with the other case um with the vaccines being forged i thought that was a much more serious offense i mean sending horses to the races without without getting the vaccine i mean it could have been detrimental to the whole industry i mean if he was passing around the flu at the races could, could have been could have been a disaster for irish racing and it, it's not as not as if the vaccinations are overly expensive or cost. I mean, I don't know, I don't know why he decided to cut that corner. It just seems it wasn't even a corner to cut. It was probably just as much hassle involved in forging the passports as there would be in vaccinating the horses. So that was kind of just a baffling one for me. And yeah, consistency again. I didn't think the the bans handed out were very um, very fair, like you said. The Lee Smith case was much more, I, th I think, would be much more damaging to the industry. It even they described it as that. Now, maybe Garo Bruder had previous had previous complaints against him. I'm not too sure on that, but yeah, like, I think consistency is probably the biggest the biggest problem in um, the IHRB's rulings in recent times. Yeah, another thing that that cropped up during the week it was it was on the back of the McNally case. There was um, a Nick Luck podcast where he um, had a guy, John Fitzgerald, on, who is the CEO of the Small Trainers Association. And he was saying that back in the McNally days, 
when McNally was uh, was brought in one day for a running and riding offence, um, an inquiry into that, he asked um, the CEO of a small trainers association to accompany him to the inquiry, but he wasn't allowed to attend. So basically on that show, I thought Lydia Hislop made a very valid point saying that the evidence that's given in these running and riding inquiries on the day is then um, dissected and looked at again and revisited when there would be a referral hearing at a later point when something like McNally's case is currently going on, where they'd look back at that and say, oh, you said so-and-so on the day at Thurless or wherever the, the track may have been. It would be the same for a young jockey as well that wouldn't necessarily um, understand the legal implications of what they were talking about um, at that stage. It might be your first time ever at, a, at an inquiry, never mind a running and riding one. So. You, you just wonder, Johnny, is there something here in this that, that there should be more legal representation for these people on the day? Or maybe if, if there's a potentially serious hearing, it shouldn't be heard on the day. It should be heard at a later point when people have legal representation or receive at least some advice with them. Yeah, I, I think um, we, we probably need to look and have a real debate about this in the new year. I mean, obviously, if, if the jockey uh, or trainer um, had done everything honestly and you know, there wasn't an issue, um, he, he or she probably shouldn't need any legal representative or any representative, but I do take the point, I mean, and you can be a bit frazzled on the day, and, you know, I mean, if that's going to be used as evidence down the line, um, it can be a bit sacrosanct, even though it's probably a little bit, um, you know, tenuous in the first place, and the idea of the stewards referring something on to the next day is something that I'm definitely a fan of, I think stewards, race day stewards are quite busy as it is, there's an awful lot to take in, um, an awful lot of uh, horses that really should be called in are not in my view particularly if they're with more powerful connections and um, i've definitely thought that down the years and uh, then you have examples of horses being called in that um, are probably debatable and i think the stewards on the day should there should be a system in place where it's just referred further down the line and it's looked at and um, but i i think you know the, the the problem the problem we have here, Vinny, is, and I want horses that I probably wanted a horse to finish tenth in a maiden hurdle rather than sixth to get a lower handicap mark, and that's kind of the crux of the matter here. You're in a lot of these races, you're better off finishing um, further down the field than midfield in a, in in a, in in a sense, and you want to get a low handicap mark. You are sort of rewarded for um, a lower level of performance in maiden company, and if if that is the sort of um, objective going out in a race when you know you can't finish in the first three you are kind of um, playing games with uh, the stewards to an extent like that's that's just the nature of the game that's handicapping and until that system changes i'm not exactly sure you're you're always going to get different characters different trainers are going to try to uh you know work the system as it is and have horses maybe you know you, you have like you have big big trainers saying he was only 75 percent fit because we had to get him ready the next day and there's nobody bats an eyelid but that's against the rules of racing you can't you can't send a horse to the to a, a race with a view to like him running 100 percent fit the next day but if it's said by a particular trainer and um, it was high enough in the game nobody says anything so it's it, there are lots of inconsistencies i still think between the high the, the big fella and the small fella yeah I agree. Um, look, we'll move on. One thing I just wanted to mention was the World Cup final, which was on yesterday, which I thought was amazing. Absolutely fantastic. After all the flack that the World Cup organisers were getting in Qatar and everything else, it was it was a final to really savour. Really enjoyed every minute of it. Johnny, what do you think? Qatar, was it a success? Would it be something you'd be in favour of or not? No, it was, it was a scandalous, scandalous World Cup. And um, it just, it, it almost goes to show the, the folly of this, this idea of um, nation states, uh, Vinny, where a country as small as Qatar, which have, not that long ago had only about sort of 25, 30,000 people in it, discovers oil, brings over a load of expats and can spunk away 240 odd billion on a World Cup that will have no legacy, whilst people around Arabia itself are starving from hunger. It's, it's, it, was, it was a disgraceful World Cup. FIFA showed itself to be, you know, a, an absolute thundering disgrace. Um, and then, of course, typically you had one of the best finals ever, which made everyone forget about the disgrace of the World Cup. I laid France, sorry, I laid Argentina in 90 minutes. Um, it looked one of the worst calls ever, and it probably was a terrible call. France looked to me in race and Harlands like they weren't even off in the first half. Even from 25 in the second half, they weren't off. And then Mbappe to do what he did in, in three minutes. And it did become Mbappe versus Messi, both playing for PSG, which of course is essentially Qatar owned. Um, and then you had Messi winning the World Cup and scoring the scoring his penalty, scoring a goal in extra time, which was so befitting of probably the best player I've ever seen. Um, and sports washing works because that's all we're talking about today. Absolutely.
yeah, yeah. And racing has a little element of that too, hasn't it? With lots of different. Well, it, um, this community, we, we never discuss sending horses over to Saudi or the Saudi Cup. We, we never discuss it. Like racing, it's just completely, um, you know, not even an issue. And all like the World Cup has been so drowned out by issues over Qatar, which is by far not the worst country in the world. But racing will send horses over to Saudi Arabia. And even I want to ask the trainer, Anthony. We just have bizarre myopia around this. Yeah, we've also looked at even despite um, the different uh, jurisdictions that are involved and the different people involved in the industry, like we'll take money from anyone in this game. That's the bottom line, isn't it? We've had drug dealers and all sorts of people involved in owning horses here down the years and trainers trying to get them out of their yards and like lots of lots of issues we know, but it's hard to know where where, where we go from this because um, racing certainly does embrace anyone. Anyone who's got a few quid, they're, they're more than welcome to come in. The arms are open all the time, which is where you, you come back to the whole point again then with the McNally's and the Lee Smiths and the Garode Brooders, the small time people in the game, they don't have the same clout, they don't have the same money, so they're not respected in the same way, I feel. Um, and it just looks to be a divide, doesn't it? There's always a divide in this industry. What do you think, Emma? You're at the, you're at the smaller end of it with your, your dad's training yard. He's not up in the, in the big guns, but would he go to a Saudi Cup if he had a runner? I'm sure he would, to be fair. He couldn't turn down that, that kind of prize money. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, like it's, it's, it's a great point. I mean, you're thinking about all of the, the controversy around the World Cup being Qatar. And, you know, we're, we're going over there every, every, every winter racing horses over there. No one says a word. No one bats an eyelid about it. I think racing finds it very hard to turn down money from anywhere, from any source. Um, maybe racing needs it more than football does, but probably probably a whole podcast on that topic to be fair it's it's a, it's an interesting one but it's you know the people going over there probably don't need the money which is the funniest thing about it it's all kind of the top horses the top trainers and you know, even we saw didn't bar in they, they took over the sponsorship of some big races in leopardstown as well so it's it's kind mm -hmm. of becoming more and more a part of horse racing um and no no one seems to question it which you know it's it's definitely maybe Football is being held to a higher ethical standard than horse racing. You'd have to kind of question that one, maybe. Yeah. Well, anyway, talking about money, let's try and get our viewers some money over Christmas. We're going to try and pick a horse each over the Christmas period that we think might win. Johnny, what's yours? Give me something good, will you? Yeah, I, I could do with something good myself, Vinny. Um, I, I'm going to put forward I am Maximus. Um, he's, I presume he's running at Leopardstown. He, I don't know if he could run in a beginner's chase. Maybe so, but he's entered in the, uh, the three-mile novice chase. Um, going left-handed is going to be a massive help to him after his spectacular uh, chase debut for all that he uh, was beaten and jumped so violently left at times. So Willie Mullins, I am Maximus, a horse by Authorised, who came from Nicky Henderson's Hopefully he runs in the grade one and um, he's my horse to look out for over Christmas. Great stuff. Emma, have you got a good one? Yeah, I mean it's a pity with the wet with the weather, it's kind of the novice chase entries are are just uh, mouth watering, but like we're seeing appreciated today and Flame Bear tomorrow and I think El Fabiolo's in on Wednesday, so it'll be hard to it'll be interesting to see what the novice chases actually turn out like um what kind of quality will be in them because a lot of the some of the better horses are probably even running during the week this week rather than being in the great ones at Christmas, which is a bit of a pity. But um I think there, there's an interesting one for Willie, Mr. Incredible. He's entered in the Paddy Power Chase. Um when we were actually down at Willie's there the month or two ago, whatever it was, at that media day, I, I hung around for a small bit afterwards and I went out to the gallop and I saw him riding out and Patrick was telling me about him. They bought him out of Henry's yard, I think. He was he, he, he had some good form for Henry, but he was first enigmatic kind of horse. Um, he nearly pulled himself up one day after jumping a fence in, in Tremor. But Patrick, um, in particular, I think he's put a lot of effort into training him. He had some very interesting methods of trying to sweeten him up. So... And I don't think they would be pursuing with him if they didn't see plenty plenty under the bonnet. So he's an interesting one. He's in the Paddy Power Handicap Chase. So I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on him, I'd say. He, he's in, I think he's in the Welsh National. It's funny. I actually asked his owner, Paul Byrne, about him. Oh, did they? Yeah. So he said, um, yeah. more or less with Emerson there, they've tried everything bar, like, you know, give him sexual therapy at this stage. He's a complete head the ball. <laughs> and uh, they're like, I don't think Patrick has ever put so much work into a horse. And, you know, Paul and Patrick go way back. Um, they've had great success. And obviously Emmett has kind of become the main ally of Paul Byrne now. But the switch from, he's likely raced as well, Emmett, which is a mad thing. He's actually raced very little. Refused, I think, the last twice. Mm -hmm. But obviously has plenty of ability. Yeah, I'm going to go for one in the, the race you mentioned there a minute ago, the Welsh National. I fancy a horse in this. Um, Rebecca Curtis's Pat's Fancy. 
I have never seen a horse jump fences as well as this did last year. He ran against Brave Man's Game in Newbury one day last year, and people were singing the praise of Brave Man's Game, an easy winner. But Pat's fancy. You want to see this horse jump a fence? Fabulous. Twice a winner in Chepstow over fences over the same course. Uh, I think he loved the trip. He, his only disappointing run for me was um, at Cheltenham last year. He ran in the four-miler. I thought he had a big chance, but he trailed in. Uh, seemingly, the, the horse wasn't well after. So he'd, um, it didn't suit him. The ground was too quick, I think. So Chepstow, it's had a it's had a run recently at the start of the month, had a run over hurdles. Rebecca Curtis says, look, ignore that. We were literally just having a run over hurdles uh, just to knock the cobwebs off. The horse is seemingly working very well since it's 10 or 12 to 1 for the Welsh National. It will be involved. The way this jumps, you'll definitely get a run for your money with this guy. Uh, so that's more or less it for the show. I'd just like to thank both of you for joining me. Johnny coming all the way from London as well on the show. And uh, we'll be back on Tuesday, the 27th of December for a show mid-Christmas during the, the Leopardstown and Limerick festivities. We'll have a show there. That's, that's the very day that Pat's Fancy will hopefully win the Welsh Grand National. So I'd like to wish you all a, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and we'll see you all soon enough. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.